chapter 5, beginning in verse 22, and the title of the message this evening is How to Live by Faith. This is the second in this series on how to live by faith. Very, very critical in the times in which we are now living. Let's pray. Father, we do come into the presence of the living God, and we open our heart to you. We know that you use the word of God, so therefore we say, then do it. God, use the word in our lives. Strengthen our faith. We need that now. And so we open our heart to you by the Holy Spirit. Use it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's the thing. We are living in times of trouble. No question about that. When you're going through troubles, the question is, see, how? See, you got to decide how you're going to go through those troubles. It's not just a matter of getting through it. It's not just a matter of surviving. It's knowing that God wants you to go through those troubles with victorious faith. I can tell you, there are so many biblical examples. See, stresses and troubles and pressures, they will reveal what is in the inner man. Stresses, troubles, difficulties, pressures, they will reveal what is in the inner man. I've heard an expression one time that life is like a tea bag in the sense that you don't know what's inside until it gets in hot water. And then you see what is in the character of a person. See, the answer to going through troubles and pressures and stresses is to go through them how, and the answer is, according to your faith, by faith. Now, we should live by faith in the regular course of life. Yes. But troubles and trials make living by faith a necessity. You've got to. You've got to then. See, I'm telling you, we are living right now. We are living in troubled times. I think everyone's aware of that. But oh my goodness, the amount of troubles. There's so much happening at the same time. There's the pandemic that has most recently now seen a big resurgence of cases in many places across the country and in the world. Then there's a national election filled with animosity and division like I have never seen in my life. Then there's racial tension that has spread across the globe and now is the time for Christians to arise and be part of the answer. But there's still rising tension in the Middle East. And now China is inserting uh, itself with an underlying threat of military aggression. Now all we need is like an earthquake or something to make people realize that we're living in those times that Jesus called the birth pangs of world troubles that will lead us to the latter days. Birth pangs means that the troubles will grow greater as we draw nearer to the end and, and closer together, greater intensity. You know, you look at the, at, the, at, the, at the Bible and you see so many examples of people who lived by faith <clears throat> amid troubles. That's the key. That was the key. That was the way that God used them. That's why they're there as our examples. It's not just surviving. It's not just getting through it. It's being victorious in your faith. I could give you so many examples. Jer- uh, uh, Joseph. One of the, I love the example of Joseph in Genesis. David, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel. I could go on and on. Many, many more. Then in the New Testament, there's the Apostle Paul. And when you want to talk about trouble, Paul went through more troubles than most people could even imagine. And so he knows what he's talking about when he talks about victorious faith. He lived it. He exampled it. He showed it. See, God, this is important. God brought you out of the world, right? God brought you out of the world, not just so that you could be saved, but that you could establish in your life a relationship to the living God as God being your Abba Father. See, when God is your Father, that changes everything. See, He is your Father. What does that mean? It means He's committed to being with you. He'll never leave you. He won't forsake you. But, He just won't, it's not that he will only be with you. He's going to transform you in the process 
See, if, you, if you've been adopted, if you've asked Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, you've been adopted. And if you've been adopted, you have a father. And if you have a father, you're in the family. And you also have a relationship that you never had before. So Paul, you know, Paul wrote earlier in this, in this book, Galatians 4, 6, because your sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son. Because you are sons now. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart so that you can now call out and say, God, Abba or Papa. It's the most intimate way of expression. God is, is asking you to give the most intimate of expressions in your relationship to God because this is the key. The strengthening of your relationship to the living God is the key. It's the key to living by faith. See, by faith you know. By faith, you know that God is with you, that he'll never leave you, that he'll be with you through every trial and trouble, and that he will use that trouble and trial to transform your heart and your life. See, God has set you on a path. God has set you on a path, and that path is one of continually growing stronger, continually getting greater in faith, continually growing greater in maturity in Christ. All right, we are in Galatians chapter five. All that's just introduction, right? So let's begin reading in chapter five, verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit, the result of the Holy Spirit of the living God in your life is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, then let's walk by the Spirit. Okay, now this is a really important key. You have been given life by the Holy Spirit. So he says, listen, if we live by the Holy Spirit, let's walk by the Spirit. It should be part of our daily living, but especially in times of trouble. If you live by the Spirit, then walk by the Spirit. Then he says, as a word of caution, now don't become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. That's, that's of the flesh. That's not of God. Chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, it, it, even if a man is caught in, in, in a trespass, you who are a spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, lest he too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and thus you are fulfilling the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he's deceiving himself. Let each one examine his own life. Let each one examine his own work. And then he will have a reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. For each one shall bear his own load. And let the one who has taught the word share all good things with him who teaches. Now, verse 7. Verse 7 begins a very critical uh, section where he says this. Chapter 6, verse 7. Underline it, highlight it, dog ear the page. Memorize it. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not lose heart. Okay, this is a great verse right here. Well, they're all great. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time you will reap if you do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good. Live your life in such a way. Do good to all men, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. All right. Those are the verses I want us to look at and apply to our lives. All right. Beginning with this, looking at chapter 5, starting with verse 22. The Spirit bears fruit in your life. God wants to do something. The Spirit's going to bear fruit. You need the Holy Spirit now. But when you have the Holy Spirit and you're walking by the Spirit, you're going to see that the Spirit bears fruit in your life. So he gives this list. What does it look like? 
See, God wants you to see this list and then say, I want that. I want to live like that. I want that to be true of me in my life. These are good things. I want these things. See, because fruit, fruit is good. See, fruit is tasty. Fruit is sweet. It's a great analogy. We love fruit this time of year. You know, we're just now starting to see some of the really good stuff, you know, coming into the market. Fresh strawberries, cherries are soon going to be, you know, raspberries, blueberries, right? We love fruit. Fruit's good. Fruit's tasty. Notice that he didn't write the, you know, these are the list of the broccoli of the Holy Spirit. Didn't say that. These are the Brussels sprouts of the Spirit. No, he's talking about tasty, delicious, right? Now, notice you have a choice. He wrote these words in the power of the Holy Spirit to inspire. See, to, to ignite a desire, to make you hungry. See, the, the thing about, you know, it, it's, it's good. The thing about fruit is it's tasty, it's refreshing, it's good for you, it's nourishing in contrast to, you know, Fruit Loops, for example. Even though they're magically delicious, the number one ingredient is sugar and the, and the number two ingredient is air. I made that up. It doesn't actually say that, but it might as well be. You can eat a whole bowl of Fruit Loops and never have to swallow. I mean, it's just air and sugar, right? And they're magically delicious. It's interesting because, you know, a lot of times kids will say, oh, what's your favorite? You know, the green one, the red one, which is your favorite? Did you know that Fruit Loops all have the same taste? It's all, it's called chemical sugar. <laughs> Here's my point. It's fake. There's nothing good about it. It's really a picture of the world in many ways. See, if you've been around this world long enough, you know that the flesh wants that which is, is, there's nothing to it, right? It's filled with air. It's filled with air, nothing to it. Flesh wants that which brings short-term pleasure and doesn't care at all. The flesh doesn't care at all if there's long-term pain. It only wants what it wants. This is the key. Romans chapter 6, verse 21 is one of those verses that should just wake you up. It's one of those verses that kind of just slaps you in the face and you wakes you up. Therefore, what benefit were you deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? The outcome of those things is death. I mean, that's just a great verse. I remember reading that when I was a young man, and it just jolted me. It just shocked me. It's like, that's a great question. What benefit did I gain from the things of which I am now ashamed? See, here's my point. You're going to go through trouble. You're going to have to have strength in the spirit. And he knows how to strengthen you with that which is good. See, that, that when God does a work in you, it's a great work. It's a delightful work. It's joyful. The Holy Spirit is good. That's the work that God does. A lot of times people, I think, they have this idea of God that everything with God is like, he's very harsh and he's very, uh, 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 but God loves and he loves to strengthen by his spirit. See, if you're going through troubles, then live by your faith. But the thing is, we are living in times of spiritual battle. We are in the midst of a spiritual battle and the enemy would very much want to defeat you by appealing to your flesh. See, because that will weaken you spiritually. That's, the enemy knows how to defeat you. If the enemy can, can, can make you spiritually weaker, then he can defeat you. That's why he says, you need the spirit of the living God. You want to walk victoriously? You want to live by faith? You want to walk through troubles and be one of those examples? You need the spirit because here's what he's showing us. The spirit will draw you to God. The Holy Spirit will draw you, will move you, will draw you to God. This list of the fruit of the spirit, it describes God. It describes who he is. It describes his nature. It describes his character. What is God like? What is God's character? Well, there it is. It's right there. You know, the law, the Old Testament law was considered as defining the righteousness, the holiness of God. These things are higher and deeper. They give a deeper understanding. I mentioned before, 
when I teach a class called What a Christian Believes, I like to ask, you know, when it comes to the nature of God, we say God is holy. Well, what is holiness exactly? A lot of times people will say, well, holiness is the absence of sin. It's much more than that. I tell you, it's much more than that. It's the nature of God. It's the character of God. And it's showing itself right here. These things describe holiness. They describe God's character. And when the Spirit draws you closer to God, these are the things that you will see in your life. You see, you draw nearer to love and you will be more loving. You draw nearer to joy and you will have joy. You draw nearer to peace and you will have peace. On and on and on. You draw nearer to the living God and you will have the nature of God shown and revealed and it will transform you. See James chapter four, verse eight. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Notice how he begins this list. The fruit of the spirit is love. The word is agape love. It's a particular kind of love. It's concern for what's best for the other person. The deeds of the flesh are the opposite. The deeds of the flesh are not concerned about what's good for the other person. The deeds of the flesh are only concerned about self. In other words, self-centered and self-ish. Opposite of what God's heart is. In fact, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 makes it so clear. Do nothing from selfishness. Like you want a guide for your Life and character do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. This is a spiritual principle that is very, very powerful. Notice that when Paul finishes this list, these nine aspects of the nature and character of God. Notice how he finishes. The fruit of the Spirit, he says, is self-control. In other words, if you walk by the Spirit, you will not carry out the desire of the flesh, which is what he says in verse 16. Right? This is important. Right? I don't like, I don't know about you, I don't like to feel sick. I mean, physically. I don't like to, uh, I don't like to feel sick. I don't like to feel yucky. That's a spiritual word. That's a very deep spiritual word. It's not in the biblical dictionary, but it ought to be because it's a great word. You get a yucky sense in your, in your spirit when it, your soul's not right. You see, if your soul is sick, then you're, you're not right within. I don't want to feel that way. I don't want to be disturbed in my spirit. I don't want to be yucky in my soul. See, walking by the spirit is the opposite. Walking by the Spirit means your soul is alive. Your soul, your spirit is ignited and it's good. What God does in you, it's right. It, I don't like to feel sick. I like to feel healthy. I like to feel well. The same is true spiritually. I don't want to be spiritually yucky. I want to be alive. God wants you to be alive. And that's what that's what empowers you to say no to the flesh when your spirit is alive. That's how you constrain the flesh because you want something better. I want something better. When you read this list, it should ignite in you a desire. I want something better in my life. I'm tired of the old man. I'm tired of the old ways. I'm tired of the mess. I'm tired of the problems. I want that which is good and right and from God. It's delicious, right? The spirit is fruit, he says. That's the power over the flesh because you want something better. You want something more beautiful. You want something more honorable. You want something that got character to it. You want some integrity, man. See, that's a, that's a hunger. That's a deep hunger of the soul. Want that, desire that. And then, then he gives us this, this, this point. Walk by the Spirit and he says, and you will crucify the flesh. That's a great word. Crucify the flesh, put it to death. Jesus was crucified. So it's a powerful picture. Crucify the flesh, verse 24. 
those who belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh along with his passions and desires. You want to walk victoriously, this must be so. You cannot be victorious. You cannot walk by faith. You cannot live by faith. You cannot be an example of faith without this being so without crucifying the flesh with its passions and desires. But he gives you the power to do it. See, the passions and desires of the flesh, they want to be the master. They want that to be in control. Right? Those, those passions and desires of the flesh. We were born with this flesh. We were born with that mess. And that flesh wants to be the master. It wants to be in control. It wants what it wants and it wants it now and expects you to submit to it. It expects you to submit to its demands. It wants to be the master. Notice Romans chapter seven, verse five. While you were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were aroused by the law, were at work in the members of your body to bear fruit to death. How do you crucify the passions and the desires of the flesh that will so easily defeat you. You can't walk by faith unless this is true. How do you do it? How do you crucify the passions and the desires of the flesh? Is it even possible? I ask you this question. Is that even possible? The answer is yes, yes. And here's, I think, an insight. I, I don't remember how old I was when I first heard this principle, but it's stuck with me ever since. It's a great principle. And it's this. It takes a passion to kill a passion. It's like, that's just the right truth. You want to kill the passions of the flesh? It takes a new and greater and higher passion in order to kill that passion. It takes a passion to kill a passion. See, God made you alive. And God wants you to have a passion for something that's an expression of life. Like too many people, they kind of walk around life as though they're half dead. Like, like they got one foot in the grave. God doesn't walk, want you to walk around like you got one foot in the grave, right? God wants you to have life and have it abundantly. Have something of a, of a desire in your life, an expression of passion. It comes from faith. It comes from relationship. See, if you don't have a relationship to the living God, then you don't understand. God wants you to have this relationship so that the passion that God gives you will have power in your life to kill the passions of the flesh in which you were born. So you can't move from the passions of the flesh to boredom in Christ. It doesn't work that way. You can't move from the passions of the flesh and then go into, the, into boredom in Christ and expect to have victory. No, the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. I remember some time ago, there was a guy who had came to faith in Christ uh, in our church and he came out of a life of drugs and he, he readily uh, would say that he was addicted. He had been addicted to drugs. And, and I, I love to watch this young man who had come from such a mess, all the passions of the flesh were clearly evident in his life. He, he, he got sick of it, just got sick of it. There's got to be more to life than this. He found there was no meaning to it. There's no, no, no direction. It's like consuming him from the inside. He saw that and he came to faith in Christ. But the, the thing is, you can't move from that and, have, and go to boredom in Christ. You're going to move to passion. And that's what happened. It's like he got, he got on fire. Right? It was a del delight to watch this young man. I remember talking to him, I don't know, a year or so later. And, and I said, man, I love to see what God is doing in your life. This is delightful. I love to see what God is doing. And he said, you know what? He says, I am. I am addicted to Christ. It was a good word, see, because that to him, that meant something. I used to be addicted to drugs. I'm addicted to Christ. It, it's a good sense, right? I got a passion now. I got a passion now. I got a passion. I, I remember speaking of that. I remember a, a one time when we were in Africa and uh, 
we had a, a kind of an open meeting where people, you know, could hear the gospel. And, and then afterward, we gave a, a, um, an invitation for people to come to Christ. And, and many came forward. And so we kind of, we brought them into this space off to the side. And we wanted to give each of them a Bible each of them to have a Bible who had come to faith in Christ. And uh, so we're off to the side and, and we're giving these Bibles. And then soon the word began to spread through the crowd that we had these Bibles, right? And, uh, and so soon people started pressing in on us wanting to get a Bible and the crowd became too much, right? And so at one point I said, you know, everyone really, we need to get in the, uh, in the vehicle, we need to go. And, uh, and so off we start going. Well, this one young man, I will never forget this scene, right? This one young man begins to run after us. And, and so we're going down this, uh, uh, this uh, street and then another street and he just keeps running after us. He's a fast runner and he just keeps running after us. And I'm watching this young man block after block. And finally I said to the driver, stop. Anyone, anyone who wants a Bible like that, he's gonna get a Bible. Stop. And so we, we got out, you know, and we opened our, our box and he's like running to us and huffing and puffing. And we, and we said, man, you, you're going to get a Bible. So we give him a Bible and he's like, holds it up. It meant so much. And I thought, man, now there's passion. Now there's passion. It's powerful. See, God, God sets you free so that you can have something in your life that's better, something to live for, meaning and purpose, direction, life. That's why God set you free. You were made to be filled with the life of God. You were made to have passion in how you live. It's like what Jesus said in John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. If anyone is thirsty, see, the word thirsty is is a powerful word because it's a drive. It's very, very powerful. If you've ever been like really, really thirsty, it, it's a strong, strong drive. If anyone is thirsty, you got a craving, you got a desire. If anyone's thirsty, let them come to me and drink. I'll give you a drink. I'll give you, he says, he who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. It means fresh, alive. It will satisfy. It's good. By this, he spoke of the spirit, it says in John 7, whom those who believe in him were to receive. One of the great lessons I learned in parenting, many of you know we raised five kids and now we're, raising our granddaughter, Avia. But one of the great lessons that we learned in our parenting is that our kids need to be passionate about something for God. Bring them into something that they can be passionate about for God. Get them to play an instrument or take voice lessons or something, you know, and, and, and learn how to lead worship for the children's ministries or, or get involved in feeding the homeless. Some, get them involved in some thing that they can become passionate about, give meaning and purpose to their lives. Uh, two of our daughters, when they got to graduate from high school, we said, you want to go on any mission you want in the world, we'll pay for it. You go anywhere you want. And uh, one of them lived at an orphanage, uh, serving at this orphanage in Mexico for a year. I'll tell you what, what a foundation. Another of our daughters went to the same orphanage and they're like six, nine months or something. It's like, it changes them. It's just a great principle. Get your kids involved in something in which they can have some passion. Because I'll tell you what, the enemy knows how to destroy your kids. I'm telling you right now, the enemy knows how to destroy your kids. And he'll get them involved in all kinds of things that will destroy them. They need the passion that comes from meaning and purpose in God, the Holy Spirit in their lives. Now, here's what we see. Chapter six, the verse, the first few verses there are so key. And the principle I want us to capture is this. You choose what you reap in your life. You choose what you reap in your life. Chapter six, starting in verse seven, Paul gives what is famously known. There's a principle here. It's very famous in the scriptures. It's called the principle of the harvest. 
And he begins with very strong words in chapter six, verse seven. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Okay, that is just strong. Do not be deceived. Don't think for one moment, he says, because God is not mocked. I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people who mock God today. God is not mocked. People deceive themselves all the time, mainly, frankly, because they want to be deceived. But when God is involved, deceiving oneself is a dangerous thing. See, what do you mean God is mocked? Well, God is mocked when a person scoffs at the things that God says. Uh, they, they laugh in derision at the things that God says. They look down at what God says as, as if it is of no consequence. It's like when today, it's like when a, a young person says, whatever, whatever. What are they doing? They're scoffing. Like, whatever. I don't care. See, God is not mocked. I'll tell you what, that's a principle all, all, all itself. God is not mocked. And I'll tell you what else too. That principle is still true. Paul then gives us this principle that he applies spiritually. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Now, we can add some detail to that principle. The principle is that whatever a man sows, that is what he will also reap. We can add some detail. For example, number one, you reap after the same manner that you sow. In other words, you don't sow sin and then reap righteousness. No, it doesn't work that way. You, you reap after the same manner in which you sow. Number two, we can add this detail, that you reap later than you sow. Another detail we can add to the principle, you reap more than you sow. These are very important details to add to the principle. Hosea chapter eight, verse seven. They sow the wind and they'll reap the whirlwind. It's like one of those warnings of scripture. In fact, I think we can make it personal. A lot of people that are watching or listening to this message, I ask you this question. How many people would say, if I had known, see, if I had only known what it would have cost me, I would not have done it. See, you reap more than you sow. If I had only known how much it was going to cost me, I wouldn't have done it. You know the principle is true. So therefore, what he's showing us here in chapter six is this, don't sow to the flesh. That's what his point is, don't sow to the flesh. See, the problem with the flesh is it doesn't care about what the reaping will be doesn't care about tomorrow. That's the problem with the flesh. It just wants. I want, me want. It only lives in the moment. Me want. That's it. Me want, me want, me whatever it is. Me wants to. Me want woman. Whatever. It gives no thought to the consequence. It just wants. So here he says there are consequences. When a person sows to the flesh, he will reap from the flesh. And what he will reap will be corruption. See, the, the thing about sowing and reaping is this. A seed is planted, but the reaping does not come right away. Therefore, many are deceived, but God is not mocked. You see, because it doesn't happen right away, you know, they think, oh, I got away with it. I got away with it. No, there will be reaping. If a person sows to the flesh, he will of the flesh. It's a principle. You can be sure of it because it's a principle of God. That which a man sows, this he will also reap. Many are deceived because they think, well, nothing happened. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. You will. You will reap. See, there's something you got to understand. If you sow to the flesh, you will from the flesh reap. Now, it's important to also know that not all troubles in your life come from the flesh. Not all troubles come from the flesh. There are many sources of trouble. For example, you might remember in John chapter 9, <clears throat> when Jesus and the disciples came upon a man who was blind from birth. So the disciples asked a question. They said, now, Rabbi, who sinned that this man 
uh, should be born blind? Was it this man or his parents? So you, you see what they thought? In their mind, this man was born blind. Had to be someone's fault. Someone had to have sinned. But not all troubles come from sin. Jesus said, John chapter 9, verse 3, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed. See, what do you do if you know that you're, that you're reaping from the flesh because you have sown to the flesh? If you know that, what do you do? Here's the answer. You start sowing to the Spirit. Start sowing to the Spirit. Many years ago, a fellow came to the church office. He, he, he saw us online or something and, and just came, is there someone who can pray with me? So I met with him, talked with him and heard his story. And, and he had a story of a mess. He had just been making one poor decision after another. And what he had was nothing but a mess. And he said, what do I do now? And I said, you've been sowing to the flesh a long time. What you need to do now is start sowing to the Spirit. Because I'll tell you what, the principle is also true. You sow to the Spirit and you will of the Spirit reap life. Let's pray right now and ask the Holy Spirit to begin to bring in you a new life and new direction. And you start sowing to the Spirit and you will reap life. It's a principle of God. And I'll tell you what, I will never forget that day because uh, I said, can we pray right now? And he said, yes. I said, can we pray on our knees right now? And he said, okay. So we got on our knees there. And I remember because we were leaning against the, these chairs and I put my arm around them and I said, you start. And he just started bawling. And I remember because I had my arm kind of like this on the chair and his tears were just wetting my shirt. And I thought, ah, that is beautiful. Those are tears that God would hold in a bottle because they're tears of repentance and it's good. See, what he's showing us is this. You sow to the Spirit and you will reap life. You're sowing to the Spirit right now. Right now, this very moment, you are sowing to the Spirit. The Word of God is going forth. It is empowered by the Holy Spirit, and it's going to bear fruit in your life spiritually. One seed at a time, one chapter at a time, one day at a time, one verse at a time. You sow to the Spirit, and you're going to reap life. Now, can you sow both flesh and Spirit, by the way? Yes, but one must overpower the other. Luke chapter 8, verse 14. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who've heard, and as they go their way, they're choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life, and they bring no fruit to maturity. Back when I was, back when I was a kid, we had a farm, and uh, one time someone decided to use chicken manure as fertilizer. Problem is this, chickens eat weed seeds. What we didn't know is that we were actually sowing our whole garden with weeds. Paul wants you to understand something. You get to choose what you reap. You get to choose what you reap in your life. You sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow an ac a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Now is the time to become spiritually strong. Sow to the Spirit and you will reap the power of God in your life. God wants to bring revival. Now is the time. You want to know what it means to walk victoriously in faith? You got to walk by the Spirit. Make sure of it. God strengthens the inner man. You must be strengthened in the inner man in order to walk according to faith. God wants to do a work of revival now. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse, prayer by prayer, you are sowing to the Spirit. And 
life of the Spirit will be seen in your life. It's a principle of God. You sow to the Spirit and you will reap of the Spirit. You will have the life of God. You will have the promises of God. You will have the fruit of the Spirit. You will have because God promises it and God's Word is sure. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for showing us that the way of God is good and that you desire for us to take hold of these things. When you give us this picture of what it means to be a man in the spirit or a woman in the spirit, God, you're giving us a picture of something that we should want and long for and desire. Church, how many today would say, wherever you may be, you don't have to raise your hand. I'm just going to ask that you would just say this to the Lord. Is this something you want in your life? I want these things. I want spiritual life. I want that revival. I want that strengthening. I want that word. I want to, I want to reap of the Spirit. Is that you? Would you say that to the Lord? I want to reap good things. I want to reap of the Spirit. I want my life set right. I don't want to feel spiritually yucky. I want to be alive. I want my life to have meaning and purpose and God, do something. Would you say that to God? Father, thank you for everyone, wherever they are, however they are hearing this, that each one by the Spirit would be stirred up, longing, thirsting, desiring to reap that which is good. I want these things. I want the Spirit of God. I want the life of God. Do these things, Lord. Do these things in me. Father, thank you for moving in power. Thank you for drawing us to yourself. Thank you for giving us a picture of what it means to have a passion after Christ. Lord, ignite something in us. Ignite something in us now. Pour your Holy Spirit out on the church. Pour your Spirit out on the church. We ask that in Jesus' powerful name. And everyone said, church, wherever you are, amen and amen.